Hi, I'm David Cleon, Senior Editor at Blogging Heads TV, and this is an episode of Worldwise. Uh, I'm speaking to you from New York City, and my guest is Volodymyr Yermolenko, who is in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. Uh, Volodymyr, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what you do? Hello, my name is Volodymyr Yermolenko, and I'm, uh, I'm working at Internews Ukraine, which is um, a media NGO, international media NGO based in Kiev. And uh, I'm dealing with the international relations, uh, with journalism, and also with philosophy. So I'm trying to follow the, the events now in Ukraine as close as possible. Uh, great. Well, I, I should say this is, we have two firsts today. You are, you are the first Blogging Heads guest in Ukraine, which is great. And, right. um, and this is my first Blogging Heads video. I've set up and edited many of them, but this is my first time hosting one. Uh, and I guess the, the reason I'm guest hosting today is because in my past life, I was a grad student in Russian and Eastern European history. I've spent time in, in, the region, in the region, including in Ukraine. So hopefully that will give me some relevant background. Uh, so today we're going to discuss the situation in Ukraine, uh, where gigantic demonstrations have been taking place in the main square of the capital for the past few days. Uh, and we'll talk about the context for these demonstrations. But before we get to that, uh, Vladimir, can you describe for our audience how things look on the ground, just what the scene is in Kiev right now? Well, now, uh, as you might probably hear, uh, on Sunday, on the 1st of December, there were uh, thousands of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people which uh, went on streets in Kiev. And some people even say that there will be up to one million people on streets who were protesting against the violent a uh, breakdown of peaceful demonstrations which happened on the 13th of November. Uh, these demonstrations, these protests uh, themselves, uh, they, they, were, they, 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 they happened, they took place because the government decided to suspend preparations to the signature of the association agreement with the, with the European Union. So this is kind of a protest. First, there were protests against the suspension of Ukraine's movement closer to, to Europe and to, to, the, to, to the European Union. But the authorities decided to disperse these uh, manifestations very violently. And therefore, people went on streets. And as I said, up to probably 800,000 people or up to 1 million in Kyiv alone. There were other cities as well. Which is a pretty and incredible number, right? Because Kyiv only has like 3 million people in it. So well, yeah, the, like four or maybe about four a little bit more so and and now the situation is the following basically the authorities are are not going to are not ready to dialogue because there were clear demands uh, to dismiss at least interior minister and prime minister and they are not ready for dialogue and therefore people are occupying so this is kind of a Ukrainian version of Occupy movement, probably, but not not with with the clear reference to it. So the people have occupied the central square. They put the barricades, and but they're very peaceful actually, and and there is a kind of a very good atmosphere now uh, on this main square on Maidan Nezalezhnosti, yes. how we call it, and uh, people are very you know open and friendly and solidarity there is a kind of a spirit of solidarity which is which is now on the streets of Kiev so there are people who are spending nights there and it's very cold in Kiev right now it's probably i don't know how it will be in Fahrenheit but in Celsius it's zero or even minus temperature it's it's pretty cold and people are bringing uh, things people are bringing clothes people are bringing foods and 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 this is kind of a very you know positive and positive ambience and positive atmosphere. You mentioned Occupy, and in addition to the Occupy movement in the U.S. and other countries, we've in the last couple of years we've seen giant demonstrations in Egypt, in Turkey, in Brazil, and in many other countries. Uh, and the media narrative around these demonstrations is generally that the people who attend them tend to be younger, more urban, more educated. Uh, they stereotypically they use Twitter and Facebook a lot. Uh, or other social media, is would you say this trend or this perceived trend is reflected in, in Maidan right now, in Kiev? 
yes, on the on the one hand, yes, because the uh, social media played a, a very big role now. Because, for example, um, a page on Facebook which is called Euromaidan, mm-hmm. uh, you can you can find it on pa- Facebook. Basically, there are two major pages: Euromaidan, which is uh, in, bo- mostly in Ukrainian, but also there is a page in English, only in English. So you can follow the events very, very easily. And Euromaidan page on Facebook gathered, in a week, they gathered hundreds of thousands of likes, of fans, you know. And now there are several, several hundreds of thousands, I think. So, uh, so it's, a, it's, it's enormous and it's incredible and it's also a great also tool to mobilize people. But have you... Of course. Ha, when, yeah. when you've gone out to the Maidan... Uh, as I gather, you have uh, you you've seen uh, how how would you describe the average person who's there? I mean, is it is it a broad cross section of society? Well, there are different people actually. I would I wouldn't say that there the, the could be one clear portrait of a Maidan, you know, dweller or visitor, because in the first days uh, there was it was uh, first of all a student movement. So in the first days, like. Uh, in the at the, in the end of November, there were mostly mostly students and mostly people who were born precisely when Ukraine was born. When independent Ukraine was born in ninety one, so there are many people who were also born in ninety one or ninety two or ninety three. Now uh, now the situation is different, I would say, because there are there are many older people there, and there are many. Of course, there is kind of um, this. Uh, many representatives of this me generation or me, me, me generation, but uh, there are also older people in their 50s or in their 60s. So this is a kind of a mixture between the older generation, the generation that also went through the Orange Revolution in 2004, but there are also people who were schoolboys or schoolgirls during the Orange Revolution in 2004, and this is their first experience of big massive protests. And today, what I would also like to add is that Maidan is full of people. I mean, there are there are there are dozens of thousands of people every day, yes. and probably next weekend we will also have a huge demonstration with hundreds of thousands. Right. I guess this peaceful, is, peaceful people. This has been building for I guess about two weeks now, um, and uh, so let, let's talk about why this is happening. Uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, the, the proximate cause of these demonstrations is President uh, Viktor Yanukovych's decision not to sign a free trade accord with the European Union. Uh, and uh, it should be said Yanukovych was under pressure from uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin uh, to reject this offer. And Putin, of course, wants Ukraine to join a customs union that he's setting up between former Soviet republics, which would be dominated by Russia. Um, exactly. So can you tell us a little bit about why Yanukovych made this decision, why he rejected uh, uh, closer cooperation with the European Union, and, and, and what such cooperation would mean for Ukraine, why, why people care, why people care enough to take to the well, streets in, over it? Interestingly, interestingly enough, he, he didn't reject it. I mean, because the official position of the government and of, of President Yanukovych is that we suspend preparations to the signature of the agreement and by the Vilna summit, which, which, which happened in, in late November. Uh, but the, they, they, they keep on saying that basically we didn't stop the European integration. We just made a pause, you know, and probably for a year or something like that. So they, they, didn't, they didn't actually make a, a geopolitical U-turn, or they didn't make a foreign policy U-turn, at least in their official statements. But uh, the people, the audience, reacted as if they did make it, as if they, there was a, this U-turn. So uh, why did he do that? Well, interesting, there are many factors, actually, because... Russia made a really huge pressure over Ukraine since August, since August or September. Why? Because I think they, they pretty much understand that the customs union will not really survive without Ukraine. Because other, well, there is Russia, there is uh, Kazakhstan, there is Belarus, and there is, there will be probably Armenia. But these people are, these countries, um, Belarus or Kazakhstan, are also a little bit afraid of Russia. So Ukraine would be kind of a, kind of a counterbalance, probably. 
against against Russia domination because everybody understands that this union is, is, is not the copy of a European Union but rather a union of countries dominated by one super well one big power right, right. So and 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 Putin was was making really big efforts to uh, to make the association agreement with the EU impossible. Why? Because a free trade area with the EU um, means many different things, but it also means cancellation of of customs duties between Europe and European Union and Ukraine. Whereas and and this makes Ukraine's accession to customs union with Russia impossible. Because customs union would mean that Ukraine and Russia will have a single and rather high tariff with the European Union. So these these are two conflicting scenarios. And if the agreement is signed, that would mean that Russia would Russia's customs union would lose Ukraine forever. And that's the reason why Putin really acted in this in this very energetic way. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that 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 was the, that was the main reason. Actually, interestingly enough, I pose a question to myself: Why Yanukovych took this responsibility to, to stop negotiations? Because basically, his strategy, his previous strategy, was: Well, we are going to meet all the requirements of the EU, all the benchmarks, except the re, the, the release of Yulia Tymoshenko, the jailed former prime minister. Right. And then uh, the European Union wouldn't sign the agreement if Tymoshenko is still in jail, and then we will blame, Ukraine would blame the European Union for suspension of talks. That was kind of a game, and everybody was feeling that this was a kind of a game to put the blame on the EU, okay? Uh, but why he, he took this responsibility on himself, the only reason I could say, I, I could imagine, is that the EU finally was ready to sign the agreement even if Tymoshenko is in jail. And that was basically the, the reported messages. So the, uh, as if the EU agreed to postpone this final decision on, on Tymoshenko. So th- therefore they, 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 they took this responsibility and that's, that provoked a, a furious protest from people because that was the decision taken by the authorities. So, now, uh, yeah. yeah. No, go on. Uh, now, as well, uh, the the association agreement is the kind of a. In this associ- association agreement, there are political parts and economic parts, and economic parts mm, previews this free trade area. But it's it's a very you know technical document. So there's a kind of a, almost 300 pages of very complicated text, and then about 1,500 pages of figures and, you know, addendums and appendixes and, and all the rest. So people who are on streets uh, are not... They, they, they are on streets now not because of the association agreement. The association agreement is a kind of a symbol, you know. It's a symbol of our movement closer to, to Europe. And now this generation of Ukrainians, this mid-generation, this generation of... of uh, Ukrainians who were born uh, just before the independence and after the independence, for them, Europe is an idea, is an idea able to unify people, to integrate people, yes. is, a, is a kind of a national idea, if you want. And that's, that's the reason why people took it in this, in this very specific way. So, and Yanukovych, basically, he, he did the very good thing so for Ukrainian society. He... He give this. He, he gave this European national idea back to the society. So actually, yeah. Let's since you mentioned Timoshenko and since you mentioned uh, this this generational change, let's let's pull back uh, about a decade uh, and and catch our audience up because as this this may shock you to hear, but but Americans don't uh, don't pay the most regular attention to what's going on in Ukraine, unfortunately, because it's very interesting. But um, so. The last time, the last time that Ukraine really made news in the U.S. was, as, as you mentioned earlier, in two thousand four, mm-hmm. uh, in what came to be known as the Orange Revolution. Uh, and uh, to, to to briefly summarize what happened there, but uh, you can go into more detail. Uh, there was a disputed election, a very close election between Yanukovych and uh, Viktor Yushchenko, who American uh, audiences may remember had his face disfigured during this 
in an apparent poisoning, um, although I, I don't know that was ever resolved. But uh, and uh, the election was disputed. People took to the street wearing the color orange, uh, and Yushchenko eventually took office. Uh, and after serving one term, he was voted out of office, and uh, I guess Yanukovych took office. When was that? 2000, 2009? 2010. 2010. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, so uh, this was, and when Yanukovych took, took office, some observers in the West noted that although he wasn't necessarily, uh, let's say, America's favorite choice for Ukraine, at least he'd won in, in what was regarded as a free and fair election. And maybe that was a sign that something had stuck from, from the Orange Revolution. Uh, subsequently, I would say his record in office has disappointed a lot of people who thought that, uh, including me, I should acknowledge. Uh, but if you could, what I'm trying to get at here is that Ukraine is a very, uh, is a very regionally polarized country. And different parts of the country have very different histories and very different understandings of what Ukraine is and what its future should be. So I guess if you could, first of all, correct anything I just said and, and, and maybe recap the last decade of Ukrainian politics as you see it uh, briefly, and also speak a little about Ukraine's regional divisions and, and what they mean for the situation now. Yes, your your analysis is 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 correct and and and, and uh, absolutely accurate. So uh, I don't have some any substantial things to add. Uh, uh, basically, really? uh, ba yeah. Basically, uh, uh, what I would say that uh, um, I would say that, for example, in 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 in, in among people who are observing Yanukovych. Uh, even during he was a prime minister mm -hmm. under Yushchenko or even before, of course there was no illusion that he would try to, you know, build the authoritarian regime. So he, he won the elections in 2010, and of course these free elections were the greatest success of Yushchenko rule, probably so, but let me assure you that the 2015 elections will not be that fair, so he will do his best to I don't know to falsify them or to 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 fraud them etc etc. Uh, so uh, this is a very important thing. And uh, speaking about regional divisions, uh, speaking about regional divisions, I, I would say I would say that the. Uh, the the divisions are now not as much between regions between uh, between eastern and western region, but they are mostly uh, well, among generations. Right, I, I among should, I the younger people. Say before yeah, you before you go on with that, the, for anyone who doesn't know, the basic regional division that that I was getting at is uh, is yeah mainly between east and west, western Ukraine, which historically was part of uh, Poland at one point, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, was more supportive of Yushchenko and of the potential European integration, Eastern and, and, and Southern Ukraine, uh, which have a much larger ethnic Russian population, also have closer economic uh, ties to Russia and, uh, and have been historically in the past decade more supportive of Yanukovych. But you're saying this is this is not really how it's going on anymore. This this regional polarization. Well, it's still there, of course. But but if you take, uh, for example, if you take the younger people uh, who were again who were born with the independence, and uh, if you take, for example, the division between their generation and the older generation in the east and in the south, southern uh, regions of Ukraine, this, this division, division is much more important than even the, the, the regional divide, even the regional split. Of course, there is, of course the western Ukraine will be, um, on the one hand, much more pro-European, on, on the other, other hand, much more nationalistic than the eastern and southern regions. But, uh, again, this regional geographical divisions is now how to say, challenged by these uh, generational generational differences. And I would say that the 
Yanukovych support, Yanukovych or pro-Russian support is also generational and, and, and not only geographical. Uh, older people are mostly pro-Russian and younger people are mostly pro-European or pro-Western, regardless of the fact where they live. Now, uh, Yushchenko uh, was elected with high hopes in the West. He, he uh, intended, he said, to steer the country in a more pro-Western direction. Uh, and, uh, and he was bitterly opposed by Putin, of course. Um, but he left office very unpopular after one term. Uh, what went wrong with Yushchenko's term and why, why was Yanukovych uh, elected in the first place in 2010? But first of all, first of all, it's it's important to say I think the the major mistake of the Orange Revolution was that basically it's a kind of a uh, it's a kind of a of an idea that the, these people Yushchenko and Tymoshenko will be kind of a semi gods you know, to 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 the to the Ukrainian society that they, they will uh, they will uh, solve all the problems uh, in a in a very quick way. And therefore, the the disappointment the dis disappointment that that followed the the revolution was basically the result of this of these high hopes. Um, uh, but again, I would say I wouldn't say that basically the five terms of Yushchenko power were basically years who was spent not so much on reforming the country but much more on you know negotiating or battling or fighting between different politicians. And basically this split between Yushchenko and Timoshenko caused the, the fact that in the later stages Yushchenko was much more favorable to Yanukovych as a counterbalance to Timoshenko than to, to Timoshenko herself. So, but this is kind of a destiny of, of many radical transformations and many, many revolutions. Uh, if if you got this revolution, if you got this you know change of power, basically, um, it's it's quite often that there are many leaders, and in the end they try they 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 they, they stop uh, they, they 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 start quarreling each other and fighting each other. So basically, the problems of the Ukrainian democracy is is that are that this it was it was basically a democracy uh, in which. Um, in which people did not yet, well, did not yet learn how to how to construct what I would say is a, a positive sum game, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, an idea that you basically you basically it, it's not a battle for survival. It's it's not a battle uh, when the winner takes it all, for example. Yeah, because I, I, because I, now I should say now, we've, we've forgotten this in the United States as well. This is this is our our politics are are more similar to Ukrainian politics than than that you might think. But yeah, probably <laughs> probably because the major problem of Yanukovych now is that he understands that the politics, the Ukrainian politics, is is is. Um, is a playing according to this, you know, to this rules when win, the winner takes it all, and therefore, if he loses, he can, if he loses the elections, for example, he can suffer a lot because imagine Timoshenko um, comes out of jail and and took power, takes power again. So many people can expect uh, revenge from her, and this right. revenge will be justified in uh, in the eyes of many people. And, well, so, so, of, uh, so actually, let me. We, we should uh, we should establish exactly who Yulia Tymoshenko is. Yulia Tymoshenko uh, actually does have a little bit of profile in in the U.S. because uh, for a, for a leader of a country, she's she's very. I guess I should say she's she's very attractive. She's striking, and she has a very memorable uh, hairdo, which some have compared to Princess Leia from Star Wars. It's it's actually. Uh, Kind of a traditional Western Ukrainian braid, um, and she—I uh, guess she was never president, right? She was prime minister of the country, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And and she's been in prison for how long? Like two years, or yeah, so already, yeah, yeah. So who? What is her platform and constituency? Why is she in prison? Just just give us a little more background on on the famous Yulia Tymoshenko. 
Well, the uh, the official reason is that he, she signed uh, in 2009. She signed an agreement with Russia, with with uh, with with uh, Russian uh, government. She signed an agreement about the new supplies of gas because Russia cut off gas twice, uh, the gas supplies through Ukraine to Europe in 2006 and then in 2009 um, on different reasons. And in 2009, it was there was a, a, a real crisis and uh, uh, Yushchenko and Timoshenko were quarreling with each other and, and finally Timoshenko signed this gas deal which uh, in which the price for gas is really very high for Ukraine. It's like 400 some 450 dollars per, per thousand cubic meters, which is huge and which is even more than for many European Western European countries. And basically the, the, the official reason why she was arrested is that she, uh, she exceeded her competence. So she, she signed this, this agreement without really taking the opinion of the government. Although the government is a, is a body in which, you know, which takes a collective decision, but she somehow you know, falsified this collective decision. That, that's the official, the official criticism, the, the official blame, right? Mm -hmm. For this case, because there are many others, there are two other cases uh, on which uh, the investigations are now going on. So, so she, she was given seven years in prison for that. But, but basically, of course, the, this is the official reason. But there is unofficial reason that first Yanukovych needed to, um, to get rid of, of the main competitor because it's, it's obvious that, well, Timoshenko and Yanukovych were the two biggest opponents on the elections of 2000, the latest presidential elections. And Yanukovych won just with the with the two or two or three percent. I don't remember exactly. So obviously Timoshenko was and still remains her biggest opponent, right? Yes. And the, this is the, the the first unofficial reason, and the second unofficial reason is basically there are some some very peculiar logic in 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 the minds of these people is that uh, Yanukovych. Uh, considers that basically these uh, losses uh, provoked by to Ukrainian economy due to this high price of gas, they're basically they're also lo losses to himself. So, uh, so that's not only the Ukrainian economy, but he himself who is losing, you know, from this high gas price, and therefore Timoshenko, as if she she took this money from his pocket, you know, mm -hmm. and and therefore she. She should either be in jail or give this money back. Uh, so the, the the logic is quite peculiar, quite interesting because it's not a political logic. You know, it's it's not a logic of politics in the in the sense in the civilized sense of the term. It's, it's probably more logic of you know of some uh, semi-criminal guys who are who are bargaining with each other. Now, now is uh, is Timoshenko. Is is she popular among the people protesting in the Maidan, or is no? She's no, not. No, she's she's per, not. She's perceived I mean, as another corrupt politician. The, 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 there are no slogans free Timoshenko, not huh. anymore. Uh, well, not so, anymore. so who do, do? I guess I shouldn't presume there is anyone because Occupy, for example, was a famously leaderless movement. But is there any politician, how, however fringe in Ukraine, who really embodies the hopes of these protesters? No, that's 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 the peculiarity of this protest, and that's the ma major difference with the Orange Revolution in 2004. Uh, because in 2004, as I said, it, it was kind of a you know Ukrainians created some political semi semi gods like Yushchenko or Timoshenko, mm -hmm. and they were putting their hopes on them, and and basic slogans were related and with these names. You know, people were screaming Yushchenko first of all. Uh, now there, is, there are no such people. There are three leaders of the opposition. Uh, there are three different parties, including one, Batkivshina, which is a Timosh Timoshenko party, but it is now, as Timoshenko is in jail, it is led by Arseniy Yatsenyuk. There are two others, uh, but people are very skeptical to them, to both to all these three politicians. There is also one civic 
movement leader who is also a former Orange Revolution politician, and he was also in jail, Mr. Yuri Lutsenko. He's, I think he, he, he has more credit of trust because he was in prison and he, when he was released, this, this person was a kind of, a, you know, kind of a reborn, I would say, because he, he really changed. He, he read a lot of books in prison and, and wrote many beautiful articles. So now he's, he's much more probably ready to this, to this position of the spiritual leader of the revolution. But again, he's not, he, he's not, the people are not, you know, screaming, Lutsenko, you are our hero. No, people are screaming different slogans, including some old nationalistic slogans or some slogans like Ukraine must be in the EU, etc., etc., but not the names of politicians. And there are also some civic civic leaders from civil society, especially journalists, who are um, more and more incre are increasingly popular in society, and probably there will be some new good young politicians in the future. So, uh, so, so, what would you say the protesters ultimately want right now, and how likely are they to succeed? Uh, if if you could lay out, I don't know the maybe three big goals that seem to animate everybody. Maybe there aren't. <laughs> I, I just... Well, there, there are, you know, because there, there are tactical goals, mm -hmm. and the tactical goals are very simple. Uh, signature of the association agreement with the European Union, dismissal at least of uh, Prime Minister Azarov and Interior Minister Zaharchenko, but basically dismissal of Yanukovych himself. And basically these uh, the key slogans are against Yanukovych as president and against his entourage, who is basically coined with the word uh, Banda, who, which is the word uh, signifying you know, some criminal organization. Uh, because, as you know, uh, the Yanukovych had two imprisonments yes. uh, in, in his, in his uh, young years. Uh, for, and, for then, rape, and then basically, right? basically his image is mostly mostly a person with this criminal background and maybe criminal which criminal was, past and maybe which press. was for yeah. what for sexual assault or for what what did he do for for very little hooliganism and little you know little thefts or something all right and so that they were not like big criminal you know cases they were very little ones. But uh, yes, so 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 people uh, and these are you know you know very kind of uh, ideas which are which are difficult to to achieve right now because we have a hierarchy of power which is dominated by the president because Yanukovych made a, an illegal I would say constitutional reform when he came back he he took back uh, basic powers the you know the the major powers and and basically now in order to <laughs> in order to dismiss Yanukovych you have to have the signature of Yanukovych which, which is kind of a, which is kind of a very tricky situation so we don't have in, now in Ukraine the system of check and balances when you ha might have you know if you want a dismissal of the prime minister you can have a uh, a president who who would initiate it, or you have a constitutional court who would say that these and these acts are not not valid. The problem of Ukraine is now that the power is is really pyramid, you know, the pyramid, and you have the president on the top, and and he is basically responsible for all the decisions. But people, of course, want early elections, and that could be a solution. And basically, in every, you know civilized country that, should, that that could be a, a, a solution but still even if the authorities do not agree on er, early elections we will have presidential elections already in a year and people are really mobilized right now and people will be mobilized even more and I think the, the battle will be uh, to make the frauds impossible and if the frauds are made impossible Yanukovych don't, doesn't have chances to win this time. Now uh I guess uh, we're getting close to uh, the end here, but one question that we always like to ask uh, whenever we have a guest in another country is how Americans in general and American foreign policy specifically 
are perceived in that country. Um, and uh, that may not seem super relevant in this current situation, but, but I'll ask anyway, is, are Americans perceived as having any role or relationship to what's going on right now in Ukraine? And, and how are Americans, how is the American role over the last, let's say, decade perceived in Ukraine? Well, I would say that the Americans are still perceived as a power which is probably stronger than Europe, at least in, in the financial terms, because in, in, the, med in the media you, you can often hear that basically Europe doesn't have money because Yanukovych wanted, you know, one of the official reasons why he didn't, why he stopped the preparations to the signature of the agreement with the EU is that Russia causes us troubles, the Russia closes our exports, and, and we are suffering lots of losses, like billions of, of dollars, and, and that's all because we want to sign the association agreement with the EU. Therefore, please, Brussels, give us some loans or, you know, grants to, to cover these, 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 these problems, to, to, to compensate for this. And basically, in the media, many people were saying that basically European Union doesn't have much money for this, but probably Americans could help. And the the hopes were that the Americans could help some, you know, loan programs which would attract Yanukovych more and uh, and distract him 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 from Russia. Mm, so this is the major the major thing. As far as other things are concerned, basically. I would say that on the level of ideas, the, the European idea, the idea of integrating into Europe is much more powerful than the idea of America. I would say that the Europeanization idea is much more powerful than the Americanization idea. So, um, Well, I, I guess one way this, this did come up, though, during the Orange Revolution and possibly since, I'm not sure, uh, is... Um, Many, many critics of U.S. foreign policy, including notably Vladimir Putin, um, have accused the U.S. of meddling directly in Ukrainian politics and have accused uh, U.S. intelligence services via NGOs and civil society groups of, uh, of orchestrating the Orange Revolution. Now, uh, first of all, is there the slightest bit of truth to that in your opinion? And second of all, uh, is that something that anyone in Ukraine believes to be true? Uh, the idea that the America, the the Orange Revolution or today's Euromaidan is orchestrated by some foreign forces is a nonsense, mm -hmm. and it's nonsense just from a very specific, very, very, you know, very specific point of view. Because if you follow the the events after the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, you would you would uh, notice that there were many attempts to repeat it, right? There were many attempts to bring people back to streets. When, for example, Yulia Tymoshenko was arrested. I witnessed one were... such attempt, actually. Yeah. I, when I was in uh, Kiev in, I guess it would have been 2007, early yeah. 2007, I saw a very large multi-party demonstration in the Maidan, which I was impressed by. And then people told me this happens all the time. That And, and I had been... I was visiting from Moscow, where I was living at the time, and in Moscow uh, in 2007, if, if you had, uh, you know, 12 protesters on the street, you had 50 uh, riot police around them. In, in Kiev, I was struck, there were, you know, probably 10,000 people in the Maidan and a very light police presence, and, uh, and, and people seemed to think that was normal. Um, so I guess there has been a, a pretty large protest culture over the last decade, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but there is also another another aspect is that the politicians tried also to you know to instigate these protesters in in some or in one or another way and to call them to the streets and and some sometimes even to pay them for for participation in the demonstrations and and that's basically uh, discredited many you know the very idea of of peaceful protest and but which is more important is that. It appeared that it's very difficult to bring people back to streets. It's very difficult if you, even if you have millions, it's very difficult to to bring people to the streets when they don't want to. You know. Yeah. So the idea of manipulation is a, is a very you know idea that that raises very much 
uh, skepticism, for example, for me, because of course we are all manipulated in this and uh, uh, that way by the media, but still people take their own decisions, and it's impossible to bring people to the streets just you know for because somebody in the White House or in Kremlin wants it. Just to give you one example. Kiev is now covered with the huge advertising against the association agreement with the EU. They basically is sponsored by Kremlin and, and by the by ex former politician close to Mr. Kuchma, the former president, who is called Viktor Medvedchuk. And there are millions, there are millions of billboard, uh, millions of dollars invested in, into it. There are thousands and hundreds of thousands of billboards saying that association agreement will bring prices up and will legalize one sex marriages etc etc which which i gather so, is is as in russia is nonsense, yeah. not it's not very nonsense. popular in ukraine well same, same yeah, sex of course. marriage i mean yeah. yeah yeah of course but the association agreement doesn't have anything to do with the sex same sex marriage there is nothing in the agreement there is uh, in in 2000 pages not a single time the word sexual appears right so, but, but, you know, millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars are invested in the, into this huge campaign. And compared to this campaign, all the attempts, you know, to international, of the international organizations or, or EU institutions or civil society movements, you know, to, uh, to popularize the European vector are, seem very tiny because the budget are not that huge. So and but when you look at the result, there is no result. People don't go, don't took on streets uh, in support of this, you know, Kremlin's ideas. Uh, millions of people, millions of dollars are basically wasted, and people went on streets just for free, and and people invest their money to 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 help the protesters, etc., etc. So. The idea that the Orange Revolution or something was orchestrated by by somebody, it's this idea is very naive because this idea presumes that you can easily manipulate people, which is not the case. People are basically um, reacting not so much on manipulations but on you know ideas which are growing in the society. And today the European idea is mobilizing people. It's very strange and bizarre because you know. Uh, what I'm telling to Europeans is that in Ukraine, the your flag, the European flag, the blue with the yellow stars, is is much popular than probably in the EU. In Greece, you can be probably um, attacked uh, where while wearing the European flag, whereas here it's a sign of of uh, emancipation and freedom. Uh, well, we should probably wrap up. But Volodymyr, are there any final thoughts you want to share, including your let's say, whether or not you're optimistic about how this will all work out? Well, I'm, I'm optimistic in the sense that the I see these events as a new society which is now being born on Ukrainian streets, and I hope this is a society of solidarity. So people are helping, helping each other. People are... Uh, considering the, themselves as a kind of a living, you know, organism, uh, which is ready to govern themselves, right? And I hope that these events, no matter which political consequences, immediate consequences that they will produce, that these events will 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 instigate this this new Ukrainian society, which will be much more free, much more just, and much more um, much much more uh, you know covered with with the solidarity. Uh, but of course, the, the danger exists that these protests will be will be dispersed with violence, and there are many rumors that in the coming days or next week uh, the police will will be attacking the the protesters because they they took some you know public administration buildings and under the pretext of freeing these buildings that there could be violence, and that is very dangerous and that's uh, very very worrying. But one thing I want to conclude is that probably you, you could have seen in the international media that you know these pictures of, of, of confrontations on Sunday near the presidential administration. Yes. And and it's 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 a very pity that these pictures are basically overshadowed these larger picture of peaceful protesters of 
again I repeat about 800 thousands of peaceful, peaceful protesters who took on streets on Sunday and they had nothing to do with these confrontations. So these, these confrontations with the police were provoked uh, uh, by two elements, by two factors. Uh, first of all, by the government itself, uh, by the administration itself, who hires people specifically to provoke violence, and by some aggressive uh, groups in the, among the protesters. But these aggressive groups are really minority. The majority of Ukrainian protests right now are very peaceful. Peaceful because basically people are... Uh, People are feeling that a society is, uh, is a young society is being born on these streets and they lack it because the Ukrainian society is still fragmented and they, they need this solidarity. So protests are very peaceful, people are helping each other, people are bringing uh, warm clothes, people are bringing uh, you know, food to the protesters who are occupying the Maidan as well, etc., etc., and there are hundreds of thousands of, the, of those people. This is my main message to you, that the Ukrainian protests are, are peaceful. And if, if some, you know, big media want to make, make, want to emphasize violence cases, this is, this is not the essence of Ukrainian protests. These are provocations. The essence is, 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 a, is a willingness to build a new society without violence. Well, I, I, I hope you're right, and I hope that, uh, that things stay peaceful and, and that you stay safe. And uh, I, I, I will say personally, I'm, I'm very fond of Ukraine. It's a, it's a lovely country, and I, and I do hope that, uh, that a new society is born there. So, uh, Volodymyr, thank you so thank much you. For, uh, thank you. for taking the time to talk. This is very illuminating, and uh, I hope our, our viewers enjoy it. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.